thank you very much, Adriana. Thank you very much, everyone else from the French Institute for being so helpful to me and also have allowed me to be here basically for two months. And a lot of uh, what I'm going to say now is based on material I've collected in Maputo and a little bit here. So um, some of it, at, at, as you'll see, the last section of, of what I'm going to present are basically, you know, I'm just going to share sources I found without even, that I even had time to think about them. But I just wanted to, to also gather some opinions and see how, you know, like how this work is going, basically. Um, I wrote a paper, but I'm not going to read it. It's, uh, maybe I'll just go through some ideas and also through the slides. Um, so I just wanted to also to highlight that the way I sort of reached this topic was, <coughs> let's put it this way, organic. I was doing my MA research on uh, colonial urbanism in Rwanda. And I, I started seeing some international connections that couldn't be explained through the general lenses in which um, colonialism in general is explained. So that encouraged me to, to start trying to pursue this, uh, these connections. And I, I started thinking that these were that these could be much larger issues than what I think, and in particular in the case of of um, of urbanism in Rwanda, for instance, till the late fifties, pretty much the way the city was organized was in a way of segregation. So pretty much in uh, dialogue, for instance, of what was going on in South Africa, and then only after '61 that the discourse shifts completely and you have a turn to the Atlantic and, you know, sort of uh, a debate going on with architecture, uh, urbanism in Brazil. So, I mean, the, the connections, they, they shift a lot. And um, so that's what I was, uh, I was going at. So what I'm going to, uh, to talk about today is how can, you, can we understand Portuguese decolonization in a transnational perspective and in relation to broader debates, for instance, about global color lines and what I term entangled histories of, uh, histories of race. So because of the title, Cells are Ghosts, let's start with Salazar. Um, so this was uh, Salazar in a speech he made to the National Assembly in Lisbon in 65. And it's a very famous speech in which he argued that we, the Portuguese, both Europeans uh, and Africans, fight without spectacle or alliances, probably alone. He was referring to the war efforts in Angola, more specifically. Uh, but these wars, they resonate a lot. Uh, as Franco Nogueira, who was at the time the Minister for Foreign Affairs, he would uh, recall this expression, probably alone, became a political chorus indicated of both, uh, indicating both national courage and nobility and a sense of isolation before the world. But if we look back at uh, Salazar himself, in 61, after the, the, political, un uh, the political unrest in Angola started in February, he gave another speech also to the National Assembly in which he said, international life is not made in the United Nations alone. He was referring to the fact that in that same year, um, what they would call the, Afro the Afro-Asians and the Soviets attacked Portugal very harshly regarding the situation in Angola. But rather than at that time to accept an idea of isolation in this speech, the 61 speech, he was basically basically trying to uh, to enable other sorts of connections. For instance, he emphasized that we still have support from the Western world, we still have support from our transatlantic brother, Brazil. So, um, and in fact, even if in 65 he argued that they were probably alone, that was not the case. 
politicians and intellectuals in Lisbon, as well as colonial officials on the ground, they were actively engaged in diplomatic negotiations. They would uh, pursue economic concessions and political trade-offs with multinational corporations. They would um, have to deal with movements of people within and beyond the borders of the empire, and they would have to manage diasporic communities in various places. So the idea of the empire as a container, as a billiard ball, was pretty much uh, untrue. This, uh, I like this image very much, it's about the British Empire. I'm sorry if the, if the quality of the image is not that great. But as you can see, buy higher goods from home and overseas. There are two things we can draw from this image. First, the idea that the empire creates connections. So here you have the idea of an integrated market in which whatever you are, you can buy British goods. But also, it, I think it highlights how the empire connects certain places in certain ways. And, uh, for instance, uh, Thomas Metcalf's very important work, Imperial Connections, he argues how uh, much of the British Empire in East Africa was actually managed by India, colonial officials in India and Indians themselves, and not by British per se, so British from London. So, um, that should say that the way the empire creates connections is pretty much heterogeneous and, um, and at the same time in which some cer certain connections are made, certain forms of isolation are also tried to, you know, they, they are also created at the same time. This is a, the, the general map you will find in most of history books in, um, in most of our education systems and even in, in, uh, at universities, which is the map of the colonization. As you can see, they are basically divided in terms of empires and in terms of the nation states that emerged from these empires. And here you have the colors that kind of divides them. Um, this map, it is based bo both on an imperial approach that believes in this solidity, this internal solidity of the empire, and on a national approach that believes that what matters are the nation states that are brought up with the colonization. Um, in addition to these two perspectives, imperial uh, and national, Many other perspectives have emerged in the literature. We have, uh, for instance, here comes a little bit that works with the Indian Ocean. So you'll see that you know, in the whole East Africa, the colonization was also pretty much marked by Indian Ocean connections. The Atlantic, the same thing. We have regional perspectives. So a lot of people writing on the regional connections, for instance, between Mozambique and um, South Africa. And of course, the connection, in the case, in, particularly in the Portuguese case, the case of Goa is pretty much inseparable from India's uh, decolonization and the post-colonial effort for liberation of Goa. Um, still, there's very little dialogue between these literatures, and some of my work um, draws precisely on that. How can we connect? How can we connect? connect different geographies in spaces in which they overlap. So for instance, what, as I will argue in a minute, in Mozambique we have an overlapping of geographies. You have the regional perspective, the Indian Ocean perspective, the global perspective, the African perspective, and I think the challenge of transnational history and a whole new generation of historians is basically to try to figure out how can we articulate all these scales and all these processes of connectivity. And this is my own map, that this is basically trying to map the kind of connections I try to, 
to explore on my research. Um, I would say that by now I would add some other colors here. When I made this map, I was thinking more precisely about Mozambique, South Africa, Brazil, and India. But also, you know, this story is kind of difficult to tell if you don't include Southern Rhodesia, Angola, Tanzania. Now I would include uh, Pakistan and Algeria, and I will uh, talk about it in a minute. I think this is kind of the Portuguese version of the first map I've shown. This is a piece of colonial propaganda, but it wasn't really colonial propaganda for the international public. It was what they would call psychological action. For the, This was made for the case of Angola. These were basically uh, pamphlets they would distribute for the African population. Um, so in this case, they're saying if you go to the jungle where, you know, the subversives are in the language of, of the regime, you will, you and your children, you will starve while we will give you food. But then as you can see, I don't know if you can see from there, but the colonial official who was reading this, he noticed that on that pot, it was written that it was coming from the Netherlands. So he wrote it on a red pen. So for, for, for him, this was not good because that sort of challenges this idea of the empire and Portugal itself as this nation that is, um, that is expanding through the territories, as you will know. Um, Portuguese discourse from 51 was one that they didn't have colonies, but in Guadalupe, Mozambique and the other territories, they were provinces belonging to the motherland. So this kind of image that shows other kinds of connections was not seen as appropriate. So that's why the red mark. This was the kind of appropriate image the, the Portuguese were trying to portray. This is from a book on, um, on urbanism, and it's a book that basically um, is a proposal for urbanism in the post-61 context, in which multiracial conviviality was basically the main goal um, of how these architects and urbanists will try to put uh, the cities together. So that was um, I don't really remember where this picture is from, but the whole book uh, is a general book, so it has multiple pictures from Angola, Guinea, uh, Guinea-Bissau, and Mozambique as well. Um, and as uh, and as you can see, right in the middle of the picture, there you have like this these two kids uh, holding each other. Um, Now, going back to Salazar, in another, another speech from 61, he also said very famously to, to Angola quickly and with strength. He was basically crying out for further military inter intervention in Angola to back the insurgency in the north. But also this um, cry to Angola quickly has been understood as the post-61 effort that the Portuguese government made to create a number of programs for massive white settlement. So in 61, an immigration office is created, and the, the demography of Angola and Mozambique from this period on, the white population raises uh, exponentially. Um, of course, as Claudia Castello has already shown in her basically the most important study, important and comprehensive study on this topic, this fixation on white and settlement to the colonies were precisely a move to try to build these multiracial societies upon which the legitimacy of the regime depended. Here, uh, Portuguese officials, they were mostly inspired by theories by the anthropological, uh, the anthropology, the Brazilian anthropologist Gilberto Freire, that argued that 
in a similar way that had happened in Brazil, also the Portuguese territories in Africa were developing a new kind of multiracial and integrated form of civilization that he argued, that he called ludotropical civilization. Of course, if you, if you think about it, as a lusotropical civilization, it needed lusos, so settlers, in the tropics in Africa. So, uh, from the point of view of the regime, military civilization and white settlement were the major strategies to basically trying to save the empire against the tide of change. And I think both of these images, they show how these strategies were connected. Here you have a military continent, and there you have um, a newspaper clip. If I'm not mistaken, this is the newspaper from, of the anti-apartheid movement in the UK. So they're basically claiming that Portugal's great solution to beat uh, the liberation forces are uh, bring another million settlers to both Angola and Mozambique. Um, of course, historical, uh, historically, both migration and settlement, they were not um, Portuguese specificity. By now, we have a fair, uh, a fairly respectable literature on the same kind of issues for the British and the French empires, particularly in the case of the British. Uh, in the 19th, 19th century, um, immigration of Britons to all over the place was pretty much uh, remarkable. Not only that, but historians had also looked at the transatlantic slave trade and the indentured labor systems as you know particular uh, moments and processes in which uh, mass mass migration has happened. Um, Again, to quote Pamela Gupta in the case of, uh, which he says in the case of the Portuguese case, but I would, you know, generalize that for every empire, diaspora was, integ was integral to the colonizing process. Um, historians have also argued that this process of migrations they enable uh, global networking. So. Um, the lives of most of these migrants, they could have, they could, they can be seen as transnational. Um, and indeed, transnationalism is a way in which historians have tried to conceptualize uh, these mass movements. So, even though the 19th century saw this sort of um, sharp increase in global migration. Other historians have, have argued that the term uh, networking is too innocent and uh, too much of an euphemism to describe this process that involved enslavement, forced migration, and in which racism was uh, a crucial part of the picture. So basically this uh, demographic revolution that um, mixed people together in a lot of places is said to have had a great impact in the racialization of the world. So historians have documented how whiteness as a political, racial, and modern identity has been fashioned, fashioned precisely around these networks. So for instance, people have looked at how the idea of whiteness in South Africa is connected to um, to the other British dominions, New Zealand, Australia, and so on and so forth. Likewise, as Adrian was saying uh, just now, other historians have looked in the way uh, at the way in which Africans and Asians' identities were also transnational phenomena. And again, the case of Gandhi in South Africa is emblematic the sense and uh, the way in which he realized he was Asian by experience discrimination here and he brought back this idea to him, as a lot of historians have uh, pointed out. So by now we know that African Americans, Africans and Asians, Asians they have collaborated um, 
they have um, created connections, alliances to fight racism and discrimination in a transnational level. As uh, Andrew Zimmerman uh, points out, from the both sides of this global color line, race operated, operated as a transnational kinship system, which I think it's a very uh, interesting idea. Um, back again to Portugal. This is uh, another piece of colonial propaganda as a city, a nation for all. And here you have this picture of what they intend to be the four racial types of the empire, the white, the black, the mixed, and the Asian. Um, this is an important statement. This is made by late colonialism, basically trying to argue that they have racial minorities. Um, this becomes important in the moment of decolonization because as Todd Shepard has argued in the case of, uh, of Algeria, the Algerian case was a very um, a very important decolonization case that sort of shaped the ways in which further events would uh, be conceived. And in the case of Algeria, also the issue of racial minorities were, uh, was pretty much central to the whole decolonizing debate. And not only that, but what to do with the white minority. So, uh, if we look at the new literature emerging on the case of the, uh, uh, in the case of Algerian decolonization, we'll see that white settlers, their security, their interests, they were pretty much um, at the forefront of the whole uh, decolonization debate. I would argue that the Portuguese, they try to put themselves in the same category. As Shepard has, uh, has pointed out, even when decolonization is in Asia was a reality, both French and British officials, they would be very skeptical about the possibilities of decolonizing Africa on equal terms. And for them, most of the, uh, the reason why they couldn't do it is was because of the white settlers. So I think this kind of image that tries to portray uh, the empire as not only um, a multiracial nation, but a nation with um, sensible minority populations was very uh, important in the Portuguese uh, late colonial imagination. Now, back again to Portugal, and to Salazar. In another speech, January 62, he argued, the question of Goa was triggered the moment India became independent. He was referring here to the whole, you know, like the 15 years of uh, diplomatic negotiations that had ensued uh, Indian independence and all the pressures put on Portugal for liberation, um, but I think he was also recognizing the ways in which Portuguese decolonization was, you know, a piece in this global process. In the same speech, he was basically um, pointing out that at that point, and, and I must clarify that this speech he gave, so it was after the Indian invasion of Goa. If you see uh, over there in Lisbon, Nero is being hanged in, uh, while he is giving the speech. So, so yeah, in this speech, he argued that we are facing a clash between our missionary lusotropical civilization and the imperialist ambitions of India, whose independent politics were clearly based on racist racist and anti-Western grounds. However, he would consider not only India as racist and anti-Western. Um, 
he also argued, the new African state discriminates against the white. Black racism have been, has been, have been revealed in such a violent and exclusive, exclusivist form that our multiracial societies to the south cannot trust it. And I think it, it's interesting that when he says multiracial societies to the south, he means not only Angola and Mozambique, but also Rhodesia and South Africa. Um, so basically the argument was that the Western world was facing this reverse racism and what he considered to be India's imperialism. And in his argument, Portugal remained this enduring emblem of the modern civilization, but of a different kind where prejudice did not exist. Moreover, Brazil was presented in the sole discourse as a proof of Lisbon's capacity to generate a multiracial and functional society. Throughout the 60s, Brazil's political alignment to Portugal only strengthened this view of a loser, a loser world of shared, shared identities and brotherhood. Here is, um, is a cartoon from, I think it's, it's a newspaper from Kenya, in which basically the idea is that they, here you have an Indian trader uh, cheating on, uh, on Africans. So you know, this idea that the Indian in Africa is as bad as the white colonialists. And Portugal was pretty much happy with this kind of depiction. They would look for it in newspapers all over the place, and they would um, publicize it within the empire. At the same time, the 60s, were a decade of intense conversations on the race question globally. As you can see here, we have uh, a UNESCO report on the race question in Brazil, in which uh, pretty much this idea of Brazilian racial democracy and multiracial conviviality is discussed. Um, so what I think is kind of debate that uh, it was being performed at the time at UNESCO and a lot of other organizations, they were basically concerned with best solutions to the colonial problem. And obviously the colonial problem was how people can live side by side once colonial power is gone. As Mark Mazower has argued, for most of European states in South Africa, decolonization by destroying the unifying human force that had been European civilization threatened mankind with new dangers of fragmentation, barbarism, and perhaps race war. This kind of fears, they were pretty much present in France as well during the Algerian decolonization. And then, you know, after the whole situation in the Congo, they, it, they became even um, more uh, prominent in the whole debate. So basically by trying to put all these issues together and trying to argue that um, that Portuguese decolonization was also part of this larger debate on the global color, not color line that so far has only focused on civil rights in the US and the apartheid in South Africa. But since I'm pursuing here a transnational approach, transnational history is not only about the globe or about the global or about international organizations, but it's about trying to, as I was saying in the beginning, trying to articulate these multiple scales of analysis. And the particular scale I'm trying to relate to this global framework of color line and decolonization is Lorenzo Marx, nowadays Maputo, the capital of uh, Mozambique under Portuguese rule. This choice is not coincidental. Actually, for colonial officials themselves, Lorenzo Marx was pretty much an exceptional case within the framework of the empire. It was exceptional for a number of reasons, but more noticeably because, one, 
of its geopolitical location at the borders of South Africa and by the Indian Ocean, and because it was exceptionally porous to these transnational dynamics, such as human mobility, for ends of labor, trade, tourism, and so on and so forth. Lorenzo Marques, furthermore, was seen as a city of a particularly intense racial diversity. By the early 60s, for instance, it had a large South Asian community, a mobile black population, an increasing number of white Portuguese, and after 61, uh, it received an influx of people from the former Portuguese colonies, uh, former Portuguese enclaves in South Asia, so Goa, the Mandi. Um, so basically what I'm trying to, to do here is to examine how the politics of the Portuguese politics of resisting decolonization affected the way the colonial state Lorenzo Marx defined boundaries between racial communities and within them racialized people in particular terms. I think here the bodies of whites and Indians were particular objects of contention as they were respectively as thought by the colonial state directly linked with the transnational context of white minority rule in Southern Africa and in this quest for anti-colonial internationalism, particularly after uh, the case of Goa. I found numerous reports that uh, document this kind of connections. For these officials, for better or worse, it was difficult, if not impossible, to separate the destiny of Portuguese settlers from that of white South Africans. It was at the same time not possible to separate the lives of Indians of Lorenzo Marx from the situations in Goa and the whole diplomatic uh, animosity is rising regarding India. At the same time, as you can see, uh, in a lot of um, depictions, pictures and all, we see that Lorenzo Marx was pretty much a white city. So, now to go up. What I'm most, mostly interested in is how, in Lorenzo Marx, what defined the boundaries between these communities and who was what has to do with these transnational processes. So in the case of the Indian community, the colonization created three categories. Indians, Pakistanis, and Goans. And I think these three categories, they were pretty much embedded in this uh, major um, transnational space. The boundary between uh, Goa and the Indian Union, you see that both these pictures, they are boundary pictures of, of, of the frontier between um, between Goa and India. And at the moment of the colonization, from 55, they became extremely hard to cross. India was putting forward a sort of embargo campaign against Goa, so the situation of Goans in Mumbai became a very big political problem to the Portuguese. These people, they had no the representation because the Portugal had to close the consulate in Mumbai. They could no longer come back to Goa, they could no longer send remittances back home. So um, in the late 50s and early 60s, a lot of literature emerged uh, in Lisbon about what to do, how to, how to proceed regarding these people that are basically isolated in Mumbai. For the Portuguese, the problem was was important because on a on a the ideological level, they could not just abandon what they considered to be as their fellow citizens. And on the other side, um, Goans in Mumbai they were seen as increasingly discontent with official with this official abandonment. So um, what happened from 55 is that Portugal 
as Brazil to mediate the question. The Bra Brazilian diplomacy created an extraordinary consular mission in Mumbai to take care of, of the interests of the Portuguese citizens. As you can see, I'm not in the newspapers basically saying that, um, that the consul would be available for a consultation um, of Portuguese citizens, Goans in, in this case. A major issue that um, popped out of this whole scenario was the issue of relocation. What to do with these people? What I find interesting here is that, um, first of all, a lot of them were going to meet the Brazilian consul to ask relocation to Brazil. So they wanted to migrate. Um, at the same time, At the same time, Portugal perceived that they could not be sent back to Goa, they could not be sent back to Brazil, and they could not be sent to Mozambique. So it was pretty much at that end. Little was to be done for the Goans of Mumbai, except maintain their Portuguese nationality even when they were pushed into taking Indian citizenship. But they could retaliate. So uh, from, 60, uh, from 56, uh, for instance, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs suggested that Portugal pursued negotiations with Rhodesia in order to prohibit that Indians would use the port of Beira. Um, that was meant as a way to block both uh, transit of people, goods, and, um, and capital. Um, and in fact, in Mozambique, uh, in Mozambique, the um, Indians could not uh, send, they could not uh, exit the territory, they could not send money abroad nor goods. Even though the Portuguese officials, they um, recognized that there was a lot of smuggling across borders, particularly between Mozambique, Rhodesia, and South Africa. At the same time, in the late 50s, the leading Portuguese anthropologist, Jorge, Jorge Diaz, was sent to the indigenous provinces, so Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea, to explore this field of race relations in order to see, you know, what could, what could be done. Um, Diaz concluded that in Guinea there were no minority issues, uh, there were no major minority issues, and in Angola minorities were inexistent. However, he perceives the situation in Mozambique as complex and cause of concern. The situation of the Indians, according to Diaz, was the most problematic. Of course, you know, George Diaz, he was an anthropologist who truly believed in this natural disposition of the Portuguese to mingle with people of colors. In his famous essay about the Portuguese character, he had placed the colonizing genius at, at the heart of the Portuguese identity. So he truly believed in this, uh, in the whole multiracial discourse of um, of the late colonial regime. But Diaz was crucially concerned with the denationalizing de effects of of Muslims. He considered the expansion of Islam not only as a religious matter, but as a global process for political hegemony of the Islamic world. The missionary vocation of Indian Muslims was undermining Portuguese effort, efforts to assimilate the natives. By contrast, they were spreading, uh, they were spreading a, a religious that in the critical political climate of Africa could only be harmful. Islam was called, as he remarked, the religious of the colored man. That Indians could mingle with Africans better than the Portuguese was a sort of race, written anxiety. And here I quote, the Indian influence is enormous. Even when religious convention did not take place, 
natives present traces of acculturation. Deer saw, uh, deer saw with great concern the spread of Indian clothes, fabrics, jewelry, food, the curry dishes, and of course, Hindi films with no Portuguese subtitles. But such cultural influence was not always bad. For instance, he recognized that they gave Lorenzo Marques an attractive, exotic color. In the social political realm, it was nonetheless boring. He again, um, he reproduces the whole discourse of the Indian as also another colonizer. As for Goans, Dia uh, uh, saw them as good citizens, entirely integrated in our culture and animated by patriotic feelings. And here is the representation of Goas as, you know, this remarkable example of Portuguese uh, acculturation. In fact, Dias criticized the census by not singling out Goas as a different category from Indians. He says, at a moment in which politically we defend the thesis of a historical tradition, the census adopts an ethnic premise, which is counterproductive. Because of their, histories, uh, of their histories of 450 years under Portuguese rule, Goans formed a different category. For Diaz, the best solution to the Indian minority problem in Mozambique was, first, to stop further immigration, and two, to undertake measures to absorb, meaning culturally integrate, and nationalize the existing diaspora. In 61, the Indian takeover of Goa de Manindu would drastically change the state of affairs and render the years of solutions obsolete. Again, the Indian bodies became the secret weapon upon which to retaliate. Days after the invasion, in the heat of the moment, the colonial state arrested those it considered to be Indians. Quickly, they would realize that many of those were in fact Portuguese citizens. It is my suspicion that given the hurried nature of the whole operation, clothing and other bodily increments, hair, jewelry, hats, scarves, birds, and beards, and so on and so forth, were essential in determining who got to be arrested. Those who did, who did manage to escape the classificatory, uh, the classificatory eyes of the colonial police were taken to the internment and protection camp. Their houses and business were sealed. They became an integral part of Portugal's efforts to pick up the pieces of her Indian empire. Mediated again by Brazilian diplomacy, the Indians of Mozambique were traded by the Portuguese prisoners of Goa. Sorry. Oh, wait. I, I was supposed to have... Doesn't no, matter. I was supposed to have a picture of the internment camp. Um, the increasing animosity previous, uh, uh, this increasing animosity in previous years had encouraged Muslims, even those who, uh, who were originally from territories later on to be in independent India, to apply for Pakistani citizenship, to which men succeed. Common hatred against India, common hatred against India placed both Portugal and Pakistan close together against Dia's predictions and South Asian Muslims were suddenly political allies. As you can see here, the celebration of Hamadan in Lorenzo Marques pretty much, you know, authorized by the colonial state. Colonial authorities against New Delhi's will attempted to, attempted to deport the arrested Indians, although they never managed to do so completely. In fact, many of these people had transnational families, brothers and sisters, wives, sons and daughters, and so on, who were Portuguese citizens. In many cases, they managed to mobilize their kinship ties against the threat of expulsion. Mozambican archives are packed with requests of people saying, oh, I cannot go, I have to stay because of my daughter, and many of which were granted. Likewise, those Indians whose economic status was too high for simply, uh, to be simply dismissed received the extraordinary permission to stay from the, government, uh, from the governor himself. So, from Mumbai to Lorenzo Marx, group categorization and racialized boundaries were predicted 
predicated not just on the requirements of colonial difference, but also on these transnational networks and circuits in which the empire and its people were embedded. Dia's question of whether Goans are Indian or something else persisted even the more so in the politically active diaspora. In 63, for instance, in Rio de Janeiro, a group of Goan emigrants formed the movement for liberation of Goa de Manandu from what they considered to be unlawful Indian occupation. Sponsored by the Portuguese Minister of Foreign Affairs, they claimed they, cl they claimed um, that they were something else, so they were not Indians. Throughout the 60s, Portuguese diplomacy claimed also that Goa had just was a victim of Nero's imperialism and reverse racism, being uh, Africa being the next step. And they will also accuse the Indian-headed UN mission in the Congo of being an imperialist uh, gesture. At the same time, however, the South African Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Eric Lowe, was arguing that India was the head of an international campaign against the white nations of the world, of which, you know, his country was just an scapegoat. In face of pressures to decolonize, the scapegoat complex was also common amongst uh, Portuguese officials. These were not, however, the only part of, point of convergence in southern Africa. I think I'm going uh, already... Yeah, you know, there are five. Okay, five minutes. <laughs> I think, I think. This is one of the propaganda pieces made by this uh, Goan independence movement from India. As you can see, Goa shall emerge, never merge. So, so this idea that you know we do not want to be integrated into the Indian Union. Here is the Indian response: a plot to make Goa another Kashmir. So they saw this uh, movement as basically being secessionist. Now I'm going to another section that I'll try to summarize, which is called Exporting Appetite, Mozambique and the Ring of Fire. This was the common uh, Portuguese representation of Africa. As you can see, however, the, bo the border was already at home. On his 56th report on race problems in Mozambique, Jorge Dias had concluded that together with the spread of Islam, South African influence was the most noticeable threat to the otherwise traditionally cordial relations established between races under Portuguese rule. For Dias, and I think I have the quote here because, oh, sorry, this is the picture that I missed. Uh, on the left side is the internment, the internment camps of the Indians in Lorenzo Mart, and on the right side is the internment camp of Portuguese soldiers in Goa, and you know, these populations were basically traded. That was the idea, at least. So, this is what Diaz tells us. Unfortunately, many of the Portuguese of Mozambique, particularly those uneducated or half educated, because they drink whiskey, they drive a car, know how to say a few words in English and have acquired some mockery of a culture often translated into buying reproduction of paintings, furniture and bibelots to which they were never used to, feel an inferiority complex in relation to their neighbors in the Union of South Africa. For many of these individuals who have crawled out of any village, Johannesburg assumes the same proportion that Mecca has to Muslims. This third class Portuguese seek to imitate their neighbors. It is obvious that such imitation is superficial, but that is how they try to fit in. Well, if their neighbors, in their eyes so civilized, treat the blacks as inferior, to them it seems only legitimate to act the same way. The true evident elitist bias of Dia's analysis was not particular. Later in the 60s, for instance, I found some um, uh, anti subversion plans and psychological plans where in which you know the Portuguese they were basically trying to teach the settlers not of how not to be racist and most of these plans they were targeting poor whites 
So there was this idea that poors were more likely to be racists. Yet, and particularly after his experience as a lecturer at this university in the early 60s, Diaz was so convinced of the vicious effect of South African racism, including the treatment dispensed to white Portuguese, white Portuguese as himself in Johannesburg, that he advised Lisbon for a move back on Portugal's inclination towards growing bilateral cooperation between the two countries. However, of course, he was wrong because the 60s saw pretty much the opposite. The increase in relations in a lot of levels, this is the military level, a lot of uh, combined operations between Portuguese, South African, and Rhodesians. Economic projects such as the capital of Aden, Aden, and you know, and here the networks of connectivity between. Uh, this was um, this is a map that figures in a tourist guide of Luanda. So that's why you can see that Luanda is sort of the at the center of the network. But it pretty much shows how you know this whole Southern African uh, dimension was tied together. However, the literature to this point argues that even though all this cooperation was going on in the 60s, still Portugal and South, South Africa were pretty much apart regarding racial policies. Um, while I do agree that some you know, some criticism existed from both sides, I don't think they were so apart as the literature suggests. And I will finish just on that point. Another report, um, this time written by Luis Caldera Lupi, who was a senior Portuguese journalist, known for having created the Lusitania News Agency, as well as for having direct access to Salazar. He was sent in, he was sent in 64 on a mission to assess the political situation in South Africa and its possible ramifications to Angola and Mozambique. For Lupi, South Africa suffered with three cancers, the British influence, the Jews, and the Bantus, whom he saw as mere puppets in the hands of foreign man manipulation. Against these threats, he argued, the muscular bo body of the Boer community or settlers, which is the true pillar of the nation, shows great resistance. South Africa belongs to the Boers, and not only for their rights of conquest or occupation, but because they have no other place in the world. It would be poor foolishness to suggest or admit the expulsion of the Boers from this part of the continent. This point, Luque uh, contended, had important implications for Portugal's own situation. It would suffice to look at these Portuguese of seventh or eighth generation, or their collectoral mestizos, or even Portuguese blacks, to better understand the frivolity manifested in the opinion of some who want us out of Africa. In this, as, as in other aspects, we have to admit a convergence in attitude that places close to the South Africans and apart from the British, Belgians, French, Italians, and many others who have also been in this continent. Lucas' argument is that it strategically framed Portugal presence, uh, Portuguese presence in Africa as a settler situation. This was not at odds with the official mind. In fact, as I said in the beginning, white settlement was an integral piece of the politics of colonial survival. But to claim that Mozambique was a settler society, and men to argue that the settler Portuguese were not merely migrants, but white natives themselves. As such, as much as the Boer, they could not, they could not be expelled. They had their sovereign rights to Africa preserved. That the bulk of the white population in both Angola and Mozambique had just freshly arrived was dismissed as an aspect that the time would fix. In this perspective, the paradox of late Portuguese colonialism is that in spite of its obsession for images of Brazil, this late, the late settlement projects did not and could not mirror the South American brother. Rather, South Africa and Southern Rhodesia were the only reasonable elements of comparison. 
throughout the 60s, in fact, white identity in Southern Africa became increasingly regionalized. South Africans and Rhodesians, not only Brazilians, were also Portugal's brothers. A few symbolic connections were traced to reinforce the Southern white solidarity, such as the exchange of cultural and folkloric groups, and mutual admiration for shared histories of suffering <coughs> in the figure of the explorer or the pioneer. So here, that explains my first image in the presentation, which is a uh, Boer folkloric, uh, folkloric group presenting themselves in the very heart of Lorenzo Marx. In, in 1960, a statue of the Portuguese explorer Bartolomeu Diaz was unveiled in Cape Town. A few years later, in 64, a monumental garden celebrated the tracker Louis Tregard was inaugurated in Lorenzo Marx, only a few blocks away from the governor's palace. The urban centrality of both monuments suggests the connect connected sensibility, that connected sensibilities are being forged along the more hardcore domains of economic and foreign policy. The manners in which these sensibilities might have penetrated white identities in Lorenzo Marx and say Johannesburg is still not clear, but they were for sure an unspoken element that both informed and was informed by the political convergence between these white minority regimes in Southern Africa. And here is just an, as another example, a news of the Rhodesia Herald basically saying how happy people from Beira was that, um, that Rhodesia did not surrender before Britain after uh, the whole uh, diplomatic incident of the independence. And I think I'll stop. I had another, some other few pictures, but I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>